Well, good morning and welcome to King's Church Online. It's great to have you with us this morning and we hope you're going to have a great time with us, whether you're on Zoom or YouTube or you're catching up later on. You're more than welcome. And if this is your first time with us, it's great to have you and we hope you also have a great time with us. Our primary function as a church when we meet together is to worship the Lord Jesus. We love him. We love worshipping him. We love talking to him. We love hearing from him. And we love the word of God. And this morning, we're looking uh, to the Holy Spirit to give us everything that we need to grow and to become more and more like Jesus. So wherever you are and whatever you're doing right now, we're going to invite you to worship with us. And Murray is going to lead our worship this morning. And we'd love you to be part of that. The words will come up on screen. So you'll be able to join in and be part of it. And just give yourself entirely and utterly over to God, the Father. And just to love him and appreciate all he does in our lives. Thanks, Murray. Good morning, King's Church. Let's just lift our voices together and praise the Lord our God. Sing at your name. At your name The mountains shake and crumble At your name, the oceans roar and tumble. At your name, the angels will bow, the earth will rejoice, people cry. Shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with 
Thanks, Murray. It's beautiful to be able to worship together and to sing praises to God the Father. As I said earlier, one of our uh, key values is that we can hear from God and hear him speak to us uh, to help us, to encourage us, to strengthen us, to challenge us, to make us more like Jesus. And I'm delighted that Sheila's going to bring a contribution now, and I'd love you to hear what God's got to say to us as a church. Hi, friends at King's Church Cockermouth. Today I want to share a dream that came to me in 2019. I shared this dream in church about a week later, so some of you may remember. In the dream I was seated in a very large stadium, so vast that I could not see the edges of it, but could see only about the two to three hundred people that were gathered in the block of seating where I was. The people were from many cultures, races and ethnicities. In the dream, I sensed a great tension and anxiety among the people and became aware of a threat to everyone's personal safety and well-being, although I didn't know exactly what the threat was. I remember in the dream musing about what this threat could be and I remember thinking, was it terrorism? Was it a health threat or was it war? As the dream progressed, my attention was drawn to a group of about 12 people people, I think they were really mainly men from what I recall. They had slightly darker skins than mine but were not African so they were possibly Hispanic or possibly even Middle Eastern. One of them began to sing Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Soon those who were with him and around him joined in and then more and more people began singing the Lord is my shepherd, Psalm 23. At this point in the dream, I saw what I can only describe as a heavenly weapon. It fired, and as it did so, rays of rainbow-coloured light shot out with what looked like party streamers. And I saw that as this happened, a divine protection and help came to those who were singing Psalm 23. At the time, in my journal, I wrote that I felt this call to sing Psalm 23 was not just for our local church but was for all of the church worldwide, in fact for all humanity. Roger preached last Sunday on Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Uh, I only caught the service up sometime after he preached the message but I would encourage you to go back to it and listen to it. It's really helpful to take you deeper into Psalm 23. I particularly liked the, the explanation about going to the valley of the shadow of death and what that meant for the Jewish people, for when they were passing through a physically very dangerous place where it was dark and where bandits could easily hide to prey on them. I feel that the time we're in now as we're coming out of this lockdown with a lot of uncertainty ahead, a lot of Turmoil, turmoil in the world, in our nation, in other nations. I feel Psalm 23 is more important than ever. We need almost daily to go deeper into what it means to have Jesus as our Good Shepherd, who will lead us, who will guide us, who will pastor us, who will counsel us through this time, whatever it is, if we're suffering loss, if life's actually not been too disruptive for us, if God's perhaps speaking to us about moving us to a new thing, whatever it is, let's let's dig into Psalm 23. Let's let's drink, let's drink deeply of the Word of God through His Spirit from Psalm 23. Great, that's th that's excellent, Sheila. Thank you so much, and it's great that Roger was speaking last week on Psalm 23. God reminded you of Psalm 23 and Let's just take a moment just to reflect on what that might mean for you personally, for us personally. Uh, reflect on how that can be applied to our lives. So, there are many different ways in which God speaks to us. And we are delighted that um, we are part of a worldwide movement of Christians who are planting churches and loving Jesus. And uh, Joel's interview this, this morning... Uh, takes us uh, abroad, takes us all the way to Sweden. So, Joel, let's see who you've got this morning. 
Good morning. This morning we want to give a really big welcome to Nina and Josh Bai, who are in Godfirst Church in Sweden. Um, it's lovely to have you guys with us this morning. Um, and I'm just going to hand straight over to Mia to ask the first questions. So, do you prefer the ocean or the mountains? Ocean. Mountains. Do you prefer a cat or a dog? Dog. Dog. Um, summer or winter? Uh, summer. Summer. Um, a book or a movie? Oh. A book. Movie. Ooh. Fab. So, what we really want to know to start off with is how are things going in lockdown? I know you haven't had, um, well, you haven't had a lockdown, so how are things going with what's going on at the moment? How's your church meeting? Um, we just want to know how things are going for you. Yeah, so um, in Sweden, as you probably know, Sweden has taken a slightly different approach to the rest of Europe. So we, um, most things have stayed open and, and we have had very normal life. So continued working and I'm a secondary school teacher. So um, I've been teaching uh, throughout the whole time. With church, uh, um, we decided not to meet. There's a restriction of 50 people. You're not allowed to gather more than 50 people. Um, but we decided to go fully online um, so we are doing everything online now, either meeting on Zoom or doing online church um, on Sundays. And then if we are seeing people, we try and do it outside, in the park or in the garden. Um, so life is slightly different, uh, but yet very normal in the midst of it. Sweden is just, um, yeah, it's very normal, isn't it? Like yeah. it's open um, we've been working. So different, but normal. It's a good summary. Um, what have you found challenging and what have you found encouraging during this outbreak? Um, so obviously in, in terms of, I mean, as Nina said, in terms of us personally, there's not that much change. We both teach at school, so that's very similar. Um, so there's not been anything that different there. Um, but in terms of church, it has been different. Uh, we're very similar to the UK where we meet online. I think that, you know, after the, the first month or so, it's quite fun and it's a new thing. And I think there's lots of people excited about that. Um, but after a few months, it becomes a little bit more, um, you know, you, it, it's just, it's, it, it, it's, it's different to, uh, to what we're used to. And so I think for me, one thing is just missing people. And like, it's great with Zoom. It's great with, we do something called online church which is super, um, but you still don't get to sort of like touch people and sort of like, you know, just be with people, hear people singing um, together, things like that. So I really miss the, like the gathered, the gathered church um, or, or just going to a small group or going, you know, hanging out with people. So that, I think that's been something that I've missed. But at the same time, that's also been the encouraging thing is that we've been able to meet still. Um, God's done stuff. We've had visitors. As, again, because it's different to the UK, um, it, it is different. We haven't had quite the church growth that some churches we've seen in the UK have had. Um, but we've still had visitors, uh, which has been really encouraging. Um, and also seeing other people lead, stepping up, because it's different. We're able to give uh, different responsibilities, which has been fantastic to see uh, new people sort of stepping up and taking responsibility. Nice. Um, if you could suggest one thing that has helped you in your Christian journeys that you think would help help me and the other young people and children in church, what would it be? Um, I think one. I think one thing that uh, I have been talking to the boys a lot about is um, uh, knowing that Jesus is with us every day, and not just on a you know maybe when we have a youth meeting or church that he is part of our everyday life and that we can talk to him all the time and uh, when you know about the small things about the big things that he is uh, our friend and wants to be involved in all aspects of our life I think that it's important for all of us to know that we can you know involve him in all areas of our life and to talk to him about everything and it's I mean there's lots of things you could say but I think that is one very important thing yeah. Fab, that's fantastic. And finally, the last question I want to ask you is, what is one thing that we could be praying for your church? 
Um, one thing. Uh, if I say a really long sentence, is that okay? <laughs> yep, that's absolutely fine. Go for it. Uh, there, there's, um, I mean, of course, there's like loads of things. Um, oh, one thing. I think like, like we, 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 what we're doing here is quite different um, to quite a lot of churches that are in Sweden. There are some churches like us and God is doing stuff here, but there's not many. Um, and we need many more people to come and join us with a similar vision, with a similar heart uh, to plant churches, help us. Um, we're still very much at the beginning stages, uh, we feel, but also to plant other churches. Um, and so I guess this, the one thing would be pray for more laborers. Pray for folks come who have a, a similar sort of understanding of the church that we do. Um, and to come and get involved for not just one or two years, but for many years. Um, both coming from abroad, but also local Swedes, um, is, is something that we'd love to see more of. Just get a catch in the vision for church, for who Jesus is, and sort of running with that alongside us. Brilliant. That's fantastic. And we can be praying for that. It's been really good to hear from you guys. Thank you so much for giving us the time and letting us interview you and letting us see your family as well. Um, thank you so much. Um, if you've enjoyed Josh and Nina's interview and you want to know more about the Christian faith or you have any questions, please get in touch on pastoral at kingcc.org. Wow. Thanks, Josh and Nina and Joelle and Mia for helping us understand what's happening in Sweden as part of our church family in different countries. And we're delighted to see and hear what God's doing through you and in your country. So thanks ever so much. So in a, a few weeks, we're going to be looking broadly at the whole issue of how we tell our story and what that, that might look like and our story in terms of what God's done for us in, in our lives. And it's fantastic that God's already speaking to us about that. And Molly and Becca are going to be sharing with us a little bit of their story right now about how God's been speaking to them and how they're crafting that into a way which makes sense and is a beautiful way of expressing God's story in our lives. Thanks, Molly. Thanks, Becca. Okay, so at the moment we are looking at the Psalms and the Psalms are an amazing collection of stories that David wrote and songs that he wrote um, talking about the things that were going on in his life and it's a really good record of his life and his story um, and where God took him on his story. A few weeks ago, Molly and I wrote down a little bit of our story um, in song form as well. And this was on the back of when Paul was talking about prayer and worship and how we can get creative in that. So Molls, when we were writing this song, do you remember what we were feeling? What were we feeling? We were feeling sad about something. We were sad about because we couldn't see our family as much and but we were talking about how God was so sane and we prayed about it. We did, we prayed about it and we talked about how actually we can still worship Jesus whether we're together or whether we're apart and that's exactly what we wrote in this song. So Molly and I are going to sing it for you now.
Okay, so that was Molly and I's first try at writing a song, at writing about how we were feeling and praising Jesus in the middle of what was going on. Um, we would love to encourage you to have a go at doing the same thing. It doesn't have to be put to music. It doesn't have to be um, the same as what we've done. But actually, if you have got some feelings inside and you want to express them and you want to praise God in the midst of them, writing something down or drawing a picture is a really great way of doing that. And over the next couple of weeks, as we look at the Psalms, Molly and I are going to try and carry on doing that. And if we've got something else to share, then we're definitely going to come back and let you see how we get on. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Molly. And thanks, Becca. It's great that we're writing songs and it's great we're expressing our love for Jesus through the songs that we can write, as well as using songs from around the world. It's brilliant. And we look forward to hearing a few more. And if you out there listening and taking part this morning, if you've got ways that God's speaking to you about how you're expressing your story, be that through art or photography or sculpture or music or whatever it happens to be, dance, you name it, there's all sorts of thousands of different ways of being creative and expressing our creative love for Jesus and our story. Please let us know so that we might be able to look at it and help you and be with you and share it with other people. So thanks again, Molly and Becky. So, let's get creative. Let's hand over to Penny and see what she's bringing us this morning so that we can um, perhaps do something a little bit different. Thanks, Penny. Good morning. So, my name's Penny, and this morning we're looking at uh, Psalm 46. And Psalm 46 talks about God being our refuge and our fortress. And so I thought what we could do this morning was we could build our own refuge or fortress. Now, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can pause it and you could build your refuge and fortress right now and watch the rest of the morning's church in your fortress and refuge. If not, you're maybe going to have to wait till the end and build it after this. So to do this, what you're going to need is I'm going to use four chairs. So one, two, three, four chairs here. You can use anything you like that your mum and dad has said that it's okay. The person that's looking after you said that it's okay to you. So I've got my four chairs. Now, because I've got a wooden hard floor, I've also got my rug, and I'm going to pop my rug down in between my four chairs just to make it a little bit more comfy. Now, if you wanted to make it even more comfortable than that, you could get some cushions. Again, ask permission, make sure you're not going to get into trouble. Uh, so I've got lots of cushions, and I'm just going to pop those on the floor as well. So there we go, I've got a nice comfy floor for my fortress or my refuge. Then I've got an ice big double duvet. You can use, again, you can use anything, a blanket, a sheet, a rug, anything, or maybe you've got a bit of plastic at home, a bit of plastic, and we're just gonna throw it over the chairs like so. So make sure it covers all the sides, but we need an entrance, so we're gonna leave the front bit open there. So there we go. We've got our four walls, a nice comfy floor, and we've got our entrance. But it's not a very good fortress because anybody can get in and out of it. So what I've also got is I've got a towel so we can make some protection for our door. Okay, so all I'm going to do is I've got some clothes pegs here. Oops. And to make our fortress a little bit a little bit of firmer, we're just going to peg the corners of it together and that will just stop it being pulled off. Okay, so peg all four corners and that's it together like so. And then we're going to peg the door on, so my door's a towel and we're just going to pop that over the front like so. And then again, using a couple of pegs, we probably need three. We're going to take the door on. Lovely. There we go. Let's see if I can get my third peg pegged together. Okay, so there is our beautiful fortress or refuge. We can open the door up. In we go. Oh, there we go. It's lovely and comfy. And then you can flip the door down and you're nice and snug in your refuge. Well, that's one way of building a den and a refuge. 
I've got a couple of more ways. I'll see you in the woods in a minute. Bye! Right, okay, so here we are in my local woods, and I've asked the landowner if it's okay if I could build some fortresses and some shelters and refuges here. And I brought my teddy along with me because I thought I thought we'd build a refuge and a fortress for him, okay? So you can see it, I've got a nice cleanish plank that I've popped on the floor just here, and then I've got three special branches, okay? So two of them have got forks in the end of them, and one of them is nice and straight and about twice the length of my teddy bear. So what we're going to do is we're going to put the two forks together with a straight one in between and we're going to make sure that they lock together nice and tight, just like that. And then I'm going to lay teddy just so you can get this a bit better. the shelter of my frame. Then what I've also done is I've gone and collected loads of straight little sticks and I'm just going to spend a bit of time putting these sticks over here to make a frame around my teddy bear. Now my teddy bear is called Blue Bear. I wonder if you've got a favourite teddy that you could do this with. And so we just keep going with the sticks, you find the right size stick, the right size place, and it's shelter. Okay, there we go. That's brilliant. So we lay all those sticks on. Now we need to make sure that there's enough sticks that when I start to put my leaves on, they're not going to fall through my stick frame onto Teddy. So there we go, I think we're just about there. Now before I started all this, I collected a huge pile of leaves and all I do now, starting at the bottom, I pile the leaves over my stick frame. Just like so on one side and then the same on the other side. That's it, so I'm giving up the last few and I've got those on there. And there we built, and there we built Teddy a nice cosy shelter. And if it rained, he'd probably get a little bit wet, but he'd stay fairly dry under there. Now then, what I did earlier was I upscaled that to a human-sized version. So exactly the same, you need the two fork stick and a long straight stick that's about one and a half to twice the size of you. You put them together the same and then you find lots of straight branches that will go on the side and you keep building that frame until it's quite nice and close and then you pile loads and loads of leaves over it. So I've got about halfway with this and I'll continue once you've gone. And do you know what? I spent two nights in one of these shelters and it rained both nights and I stayed pretty dry. So, if you had a go at the inside den, why not have a go at a, a teddy den? You could maybe do that in your garden. You probably need to go to the woods to build the adult size one, unless you've got a really big garden. Um, and see if you can build yourself a fortress. Now, another thing I like to do, especially if I've got a friend or brother or sister, is I get them to lie in the den, get a big can of water, and I pour the water over the den, and I see if it leaks or not. If I've built it well, they shouldn't get wet. I've not built it that well. I get a bit down. Why not have a try at those? Always ask your parents before you do it. And like I say, if you don't have to private woodland, always ask the landowner's permission before that. See you later. Bye bye. Penny, that's awesome. That's brilliant. And uh, it's good to see how we can pictorially make an image, you know, through building something that shows how God is our refuge and our strength where the writers can run to him and be safe, or in your case, Penny, hopefully dry. That's awesome. Thank you so much. So John's going to read the Bible to us. And directly after that, Patrick's going to bring the word of God to us. And we want you to listen and take notes and hear what God's saying to you and what God is challenging you or encouraging you with right now. And we're looking forward to hearing what God's got to say. Over to you, John. 
Good morning. Psalm 46 from the English Standard Version. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Selah. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolation on earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariot with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted amongst the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. As Roger said last week, we all tend to have a favourite psalm, and we return to it in times of worship, praise or need. The psalm read to us by John is not actually my number one, but if I were on a programme of, say, um, Desert Island Psalms, it would be one of my eight. It was not always so. It was when I was a young teenager, uh, attending church, often on my own, just starting my walk with God, I found the two psalms in every service sung to a dull tune, very tedious. So children, teenagers, I know sometimes the Bible has passages that are difficult, even seeming irrelevant. But believe me, as you grow and become more experienced in life, they become rich gems. Psalms are so honest. As writers pour out their distress and praise, even within the same psalm. Failings, doubts, delights and joy, they're all there. The very opposite of, how are you? I'm, I'm fine. In this one, Psalm 46, we have some famous lines. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress, Selah. Be still and know that I am God. If 46 is your favourite, then you are in good company. It was Martin Luther's, and on which he based a famous hymn called A Mighty Fortress is Our God. When he was called in front of his peers to a meeting to recount on his teaching of justification by faith, he retired to a room to consider his response. He opened his Bible and it was at Psalm 46. The rest is history. John Wesley's last words before he died echoed it. The best of all is God is with us. Incidentally, in case you're interested, my Desert Island 8 are 8, 23, 34, 41, 46, 51, 121 and 139. Another important thing about Psalms is that they're not all written by David. Only half of them are attributed to him. Moses and Solomon have them, so does Asaph, and 51 are attributed to Anonymous, but no one seems to know who he is. This one is by the sons of Korah, who were temple musicians. Also, Psalms were written over many centuries, and whilst some relate to no obvious events, others, like 46, theologians believe, have a historical context. In 2 Kings 18 and 19 and Isaiah 36, 37, and kids, I suggest you read one of those. It's a great story. You can hear the story that commentators suggest is the context to the psalm. A siege of the city of God, Jerusalem. On this occasion, the Assyrian ruler, Sennacherib, had invaded Judah with a massive army. Why? 
Well, for once, Judah had a good, godly king, Hezekiah, and he'd taken steps to return the country to a God-fearing nation. Foreign idols had been destroyed, and the law of Moses observed, and Jews flocked in from the northern kingdom, having been displaced. The Bible records that Hezekiah trusted in the Lord God of Israel and held fast to the Lord, and the Lord was with him. But the country of Judah was a client state of Assyria, a vassal, and when Hezekiah decided to withhold tribute, that's money, from Sennacherib, the inevitable happened. And in 701 BC, Judah was invaded. Now Hezekiah knew this might happen. After all, some years earlier, Sennacherib's pre predecessor invaded the northern kingdom and displaced hundreds of thousands of Jews. But Hezekiah believed the new king to be weaker and he'd been assured of support from Egypt. Also, the city of Babylon had revolted against Sennacherib. Unfortunately, Sennacherib was far from weak. He destroyed Babylon, put down all rebellions. So Hezekiah made preparations, some of which are still visible today. The fortress part of Jerusalem was reinforced and he had a waterway built through over 500 meters of rock so the city had an abundant water supply, critical in times of siege. Sennacherib, uh, Sennacherib's army took town after town in Judah and on reaching Jerusalem, bypassed it to take Judah's second city, Lachish, in a most brutal fashion, as an example to Jerusalem. In the meantime, the Assyrians had defeated an Egyptian army sent to support Judah. We know a lot about this, as the Assyrians kept good records, and some of which sit in the British Museum. You can look at them. A detailed account of the invasion of Judah is written on a hexagonal stone prison, excavated from Nineveh. That's it. Though interestingly, but perhaps unsurprisingly, it misses out the final income, outcome, the final outcome. As the Assyrians camp to the north of Jerusalem, Hezekiah is beside himself in sackcloth, praying unceasingly, having offered to pay the tribute, but Senator once more. He sends envoys into Jerusalem to announce before the people that Hezekiah cannot protect them from destruction, and more particularly, neither can their God. They must surrender their city to him. Hezekiah turns to Isaiah, you'll remember him, he's the one who has a vision from God and says in answer to the call, who shall I send, who will go for us? He says, that's Isaiah, here am I, send me. Isaiah reassures Hezekiah, firstly, do not be afraid as the Assyrians and mocking words have reviled the Lord. Secondly, that Sennacherib will be called back to home and will be assassinated. Thirdly, that the Assyrians will not set foot in the city. 2 Kings 19 verse 34, God says, for I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. It goes on with terrifying words. And that night, the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And the people rose early in the morning. Behold, these were all dead bodies. Then Sennacherib went home, and yes, was later assassinated by his sons. And it's a mystery, perhaps, as to why the Assyrian record, rec, records do not record the reason why Sennacherib did not take Jerusalem, only recording that the city was surrounded and tribute was paid. 200 years later, a Greek historian Herodotus provided a theory that it was a plague-ridden mice that did it. So why do I go into this? Well, I love history and how it and archaeology interweave with both a Bible account in Kings and a prophet's writings in Isaiah, together with a psalm. Also, it's an example of God's people facing seemingly catastrophic situations. In our times, that may well be individually illness, or job loss, or pandemic. 
we know what it is to be holed up in fortress houses. The psalm itself is beautifully crafted with verses of promise surrounding verses of distress. It's, it's like a father surrounding his child with love and protection. It does not promise that we won't experience trouble, but that he will be our protector. He'll be your protector. Psalm 46 is clear in the initial verses that the Lord, in the Lord, we have our fortress, our refuge, and nothing nature, that's landslips, earthquakes, tsunamis, floods, or man-made wars can breach it. People inside are safe. Those of us who've been Christians for a long time will testify to the truth of this. When we have been besieged by troubles and assaulted by spiritual attack, we have known what David says in Psalm 41, another of my Desert Island 8. By this I know, that's faith, by this I know you delight in me. My enemy will not shout in triumph over me. If we live in his protection, then we have nothing to fear. He protects us and strengthens us. Indeed, not only is he all-powerful, the psalm confirms he is ever-present. With this kind of confidence, do we need to fear or panic? You might, you'll note the change of tone in verse 4, when the psalmist refers to the river whose streams make glad the city of God. That's Jerusalem. You'll remember Hezekiah's water tunnel I mentioned. But there is more to be glad about than just water. The Lord himself inhabits the city. He has chosen to live there, to dwell there. His presence ensures ultimate protection, no matter what chaotic events are happening around us, as they are even now in our times. With growing confidence, the psalmist is clear Maybe even as he imagines looking at the vast armies outside the wall, God will help when the morning dawns. And he terrifically does. As Psalm 30 says, there may be weeping in the night, but joy comes in the morning. The psalmist now invites us on a journey through history. He points out God is the ultimate power in the universe. It is the Lord, not nations, that ultimately decide history and bring peace. And in the midst of the turmoil and uncertainty is issued those famous words of comfort and truth to you and me. God speaks. Be still and know that I am God. <laughs> we often quote these words in quiet tones as an encouragement to just take some time out, to listen, stop talking for a while. But in this context, it is a command. Be still. Be quiet. Stop panicking. Put aside your weapons of fighting, whatever they are, and whatever is going on, and rest on the promises of God. The Hebrew word translated be still literally means to cause to fall away, let go. I can't help thinking about those plasticine characters, Wallace and Gromit, when the man is waving his hands in the air, panicking, yelling, oh, Gromit, and the dog calmly lowers his eyes, tuts, and shakes his head knowing exactly what to do. I understand Wallace only too well. I get very stressed over quite small setbacks. I hear those words, be still and know, and it challenges me, challenges us to believe what we believe, that God is in control, know it, have believing faith in it, be still and know. If you read the psalm, you'll notice the psalmist puts in the word selah, three times, each after a momentous statement like, the Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our fortress, Selah. Selah is understood to be a musical term, meaning interlude or pause. Reflect on what we have heard, wait expectantly on what comes next. The Lord is with us, he dwells with us. Isaiah also prophesied that Emmanuel, a name which literally means God with us, the Messiah, in the person of Jesus, would also come and dwell with us. And he has. More than that, he is the perfect saviour, 
and protector, being God's own son, and through his sacrificial death and glorious resurrection gives those who know him security now and assurance of eternal life. If you don't know him, then now is the time to get to know him. Fear is an emotion caused by the threat of danger, pain or harm. It, it's heightened by not knowing the outcome or, or more likely imagining the outcome will be so much worse than it is. And we live in a time of uncertainty and fear. I've thought and read a lot about this psalm and there is a possibility that we might just simply dismiss it as poetry, just words of no real help. I've tried to put the psalm in a historical context that was real, related to Jesus who was real, invoked testimony of other Christians that is real. Now how to make it real to us now? We'll test it. Sennacherib mocked our Lord by saying he could not protect Hezekiah in Jerusalem. Whether you are a child being bullied dealing with a difficult person or situation at work, facing debt, illness, or the trials of old age, whatever, the Lord's voice in this psalm is for you. The same voice that makes the earth melt in verse 6 also says in verse 10, be still to us, let go. Let us be, let us open, not, not empty, our minds and our hearts to him. As we read the psalm, memorise it, meditate on each verse and say in faith, yes, you are my strength. Yes, you are my refuge. Yes, you are ever present. Therefore, yes, I will not fear. It's a cry of defiance, really. Then ask the Lord how he wants these promises to be worked out in your situation, then pause expectantly to see how he works it out. Allow the Holy Spirit to bring peace to your soul. Sila. In a moment, I will pray. This is a prayer Paul did uh, made to the Ephesians in chapter 3 of that uh, book. The Lord, the Lord not only chooses to dwell in us, but also in his church, our church. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to, immeasure, to do immeasurably more than we all ask or imagine, according to his power that is in working within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus and throughout all generations, forever and ever. Thanks, Patrick. Let's just take a moment to reflect and to think about what Patrick's brought to us this morning, the encouragement and the way that he's led us through that psalm. Just think about how we are safe, that we have nothing to fear, that God is with us, that we can take time to contemplate and to pause and to hear God. Father, we just want to thank you for your word to us this morning. We thank you that you are with us, Emmanuel. God is with us. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are uh, dwelling among us through the power of your Holy Spirit, that you have chosen to dwell with us, that you've chosen to inhabit 
the prayers of your people. And we want to thank you that the living God takes a deep interest in each one of us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your word. Thank you for the way you've been with us this morning. Thank you for the way that you've challenged us, the way that you've encouraged us. Lord, we appreciate you so much. We appreciate what you do in our lives. And we honour you and we thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. So let's finish our time together. Murray's going to lead us in another song. And then after that, we're going to say goodbye for this morning. And our children will spend some time together. So why don't you, again, why don't you join with us as we worship Jesus and love him together.
Well, thanks for being with us this morning. Thanks for spending some time with us and we trust you have a great week. We'll probably start to see each other more and more around the town. Um, be careful you stay alert and that you stay safe. Uh, and as you start beginning to go back to your place of work, we pray that God's safety and blessing upon you uh, and upon all that you do. So thanks for coming this morning. We'd like you to uh, have a great week, but we're now going to give uh, the time over to our children so that they can spend some time together uh, and have a good time together. Thanks ever so much. Goodbye. <laughs>